the word evolution, although not a common one in the English language at the time, had a definite meaning, primarily in poetry and metaphor, and it meant progress. Evolutio means unfolding. Literally, evolution is an unfolding of a kind of preordained or prearranged sequence. And Darwin's theory is non-progressivist. That's what's unique about it. That's why he doesn't use the word. That in a, in a line is the resolution of the second riddle. If there's one thing we desperately want evolution to be, it's a principle that predicts progress, or that sees progressive complexification as a property of evolution through time, because it's only that way that we can justify our eventual appearance and our hegemony over this earth as somehow implicit in the workings of evolutionary theory. We don't want to believe the converse, which I think is true, that we're just an accidental little late arising twig on this enormously arborescent bush of life, which if you could replant it from seed would probably never yield anything like us again. That I think is correct. But we don't want to see that. We wish to view evolution as inherently and predictably progressive so that the origin of something like us that we occupy but a millimicrosecond of cosmic time is reasonable and predictable. That's what we want. So Darwin doesn't use the word evolution because it meant progress. And his theory, almost uniquely among 19th century evolutionary theories, was non-progressivist. As I said before, Darwin's theory is about local adaptation. It is about adaptation to changing local environments. The hairy elephant in Russia is a better elephant for that environment. But it's not a better elephant in any cosmic or general sense. And that's all natural selection can do for you. It can adapt you to changing local environments. As environments change on a random vector through time, you're not going to extract from a process that merely adapts to changing local environments any overarching principle of progress. And Darwin was well aware of that. Look, this is a complex subject. I don't have time for it. Darwin was an eminent Victorian, and he managed to smuggle a kind of argument about progress back in under another guise. But he was very clear in his recognition that the bare-bones mechanics of the theory of natural selection yields no principle of progress. And in that is perhaps its greatest radicalism with respect to pop culture's perception of what evolution must be and mean. And there's much documentation of this in Darwin. He wrote a little marginal note in one of his books once, never say higher or lower in referring to organisms. He had a correspondence late in his life with a man whose office I now occupy, the Harvard paleontologist at the time, Alpheus Hyatt. Now Hyatt was a convinced progressionist who thought that there was a principle of progress pervading evolution. Darwin wrote to him, finally, its last line, after long reflection, I cannot avoid the conclusion that no inherent tendency to progressive development exists. I can't get any clearer than that. So why do we call the process evolution? And that's an interesting story, too. Uh, the main answer is Herbert Spencer, the great Victorian polymath of nearly everything. Herbert Spencer, whose writings were so influential in Darwin's age, did have an explicitly progressivist theory, not only of biological change, but of every kind of change, whether it was cosmological, economic, artistic, human cultural, they were all inherently progressive, and therefore he called them evolution because he knew what the word meant. Now, since most 19th century thinkers wouldn't accept Darwin's radicalism any more than we would today, they were very comfortable with Spencer's notion that you ought to use a word that means inherent progress because that's how they wanted to see evolution as a process that predicted an inherent form of progress. Eventually, Darwin gave up late in his life. I think in his last book on worms, he finally uses the word evolution in Spencer's sense as everybody else was. But he initially didn't want to because his theory was non-progressive. And therein lies his other, in many ways, in terms of pop culture, misconceptions, his greatest radicalism. Well, now look at my second set of slides which some of you have heard me talk before, have seen at least some of these before. These are a series of slides primarily from advertising and pop culture, illustrating our misidentification of evolution, our misequation, I should say, of evolution with a notion of inherent progress. It doesn't mean that. 
And yet the only icon we know, the only picture we know of evolution, is the ladder of ascent from ape to human or from single-celled creature up. Look, I'm not saying that this is literally what we believe. This is a caricature. That's why it's funny. That's why cartoonists and advertisers use it. But it's only a caricature of what we really do believe, that there is a more general predictable form. We wouldn't understand it as the primary icon of evolution if it weren't, in fact, a caricature of our actual beliefs, namely that there is, at least in a broad sense, a predict progressivist predictability to increase in complexification and evolution. These come primarily from cartooning and advertising. My friend Mike Peters, who does Mother Goose and Grimm and who started at the Dayton Daily News as their editorial cartoonist, once put it to me very well in saying, if you want to really understand what pop culture takes as its primary picture of any phenomenon, you look to our work. Because as you're going through your newspaper, you're going to give one-tenth of a second's attention to any drawing that you see. And unless it is the canonical drawing, the one that everybody understands, you'll pass it by. And that's why we have to use the drawing that people understand. So here is evolution in popular culture. And I know no more dramatic example of our continuing confusion of evolution with progress and, our theref and therefore, as Muller put it, our inability really to grasp the essence of Darwin's argument. This is the anywhere in America where scientific creationism is rampant version. Here's a gentleman holding a sign saying Earth is only 10,000 years old, standing in his proper place in the sequence. But do notice the progressive lightening of skin in the racist tradition, and that's not because there's less hair, there's actually a lightening of skin. We do this so unconsciously, we don't even see the racist context out of which it came. We are. And by the way, uh, quite apart from its moral perniciousness, it doesn't even make any sense in any way, no matter what your views on race are, all human races are equally old. It doesn't make any logical sense to depict that current variety with any one race, whatever one you choose. Okay, so that's that. Now, what is Darwinian theory about? As I said, these are my last couple slides, it is about adaptation to changing local environments. That's all it's about, principle of natural selection. Every naturalist has their favorite example. I will give you mine. Uh, where'd it go? <laughs> This looks for all the world like a fish, right? It's got an eye, it's got fins, waves the fins, but it's not a fish. In fact, it is a brood pouch for eggs of a clam, a freshwater mussel, a unionid mussel called Lamcillus. Now, why should a clam evolve a brood pouch that looks like a decoy fish on its rear end? As soon as you understand the breeding cycle of these clams, it becomes clear. These clams uniquely among the clams have larvae which must become parasitic on the gills of a fish if they're going to survive. So a real fish comes down to eat or to investigate. The mother fish shoots the larvae at the act of the body, the mother clam shoots the larvae at the actual fish, and some of them attach to the gills and begin their free ride into the next generation. And that's a wonderfully exquisite, remarkable adaptation. I mean, it just fills you with awe and marvel. But it doesn't make a better clam in any cosmic sense, right? This clam isn't better than a scallop, it's not better than a quahog, it's not better than an oyster, it's just a clam with an exquisite adaptation to its own immediate state. That's what Darwinian theory is about.